Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today I have another reaction video. Uh, this is another one uh, responding to Wisecrack. Uh, another uh, another philosopher on their channel uh, has a video out on uh, on education and sort of the purpose of higher education and some of the problems with uh, with particularly higher education, uh, particularly in uh, in the U.S. I take it from the title of the video. Um, on which note, I have yet to see this. Uh, it was only recommended to me by quite a few people. And so I thought I would uh, give it a watch and get my uh, get my my completely fresh reaction to it. Let you know what I have to say. Um, from what I gather, there are some things that they almost get right, uh, and then veer wildly off course. So, without any uh, really further delay, let's um let's have a watch. Um, I am going to be uh, skipping over things like sponsor segments, introductions, that sort of thing. Uh, as best I can, uh, and also I'll be uh, playing the video at 1.5 times speed, so if that means that you need to slow it down a little bit, uh, or what have you, then feel free. I will, I will take no offense at any such thing. So, let's uh, see what they have to say. College is a scam. Yeah, it's a phrase we're hearing a lot these days. Now, for some, degrees aren't a good return on investment. For others, colleges are factories mass-producing woke sheeple. And for some... Okay, uh, colleges are not. A good return on investment at least not usually uh unless you are specifically going for something like a technical degree if you are going to college to learn something specific that will that you know in advance will uh which you are doing for the sake of career advancement college is a bad investment uh i i say that as as a college professor <clears throat> um this is probably going to preempt something that, that they're going to talk about to some degree, and maybe I'm going to wind up agreeing with them. Maybe I'm going to wind up having to do some nuancey type stuff, but I want to get my view on the matter uh, relatively clear right, right out of the gate here that higher education, university education, especially a liberal arts education rather than a technical degree or, or a professional degree, but a uh, liberal arts education <clears throat> uh, is an end good, or it should be thought of as an end good. It is something that we pursue uh, because it's worth pursuing, independent of what it will get us. Uh, it is intrinsically worth pursuing, but not, or it shouldn't be, extrinsically worth pursuing. Uh, we should pursue uh, higher education in the same way that we would pursue um, any other sort of self-edification or self-development or self-improvement or even, perish the thought to say, leisure. Right, uh, leisure or entertainment or that sort of thing, and so I do think that uh, while I, while probably everyone should get a liberal arts education, for a lot of people that that the time to do that is later in life when you're well established, you have a career, you have uh, the means to do so without you know sinking yourself into debt. So anyway, that is that is a, a very brief outline of my thoughts on on the matter right off the bat here, uh, having to do with education as an investment, because I think that. Most of us have been sort of sold a false bill of goods that uh, that that higher education is an investment that it's going to be this this massive boost to your career, which in some cases it might be, especially if you are pursuing something very specific. But in general, that's not what it's there for, uh, and it never has been. If we look back to the foundations of the university a thousand years ago, or so, a a liberal education. A, an undergraduate, what we would call an undergraduate education, was for the purpose of 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 developing one's virtue, one's person, one one's personhood, right? More so than developing, you know, a particular set of skills that will advance your career. If you wanted to do that, you would apprentice, right? Or you would, which the equivalent in today's world is is. Either say I don't know internship or just getting a job, an entry level job. That's again radically different to uh, to that, that is to say the proper way of looking at higher education is radically different from the way we have been so thoroughly trained to look at uh, to look at higher education. Um, I I direct you to um, an essay from C. S. Lewis called Our English Syllabus. Where he talks a lot about this topic, um, I did an audiobook recording of the essay, and it's on this channel. I'll put it in the description. Have a look um, in the the part up there and the description down there, wherever you might. 
But let's get back to Wisecrack, see what they have to say about this. Some folks, it's both. Now, we often hear that college degrees are useless, with students learning subjects that are equivalent to major in basket weaving, rather than marketable skills to help them succeed in a competitive economy. But is this an accurate representation of what education is, or of what it should be? Or as scholar Paolo Freire argues, are these common views of education dependent on what he calls the banking model, where learning becomes little more than a transaction? Well, let's try to just figure it all out today. I don't, I'm not familiar with Thierry's banking model, so to speak, but, <clears throat> uh, but yeah, learning is a transaction. Like that's, it always has been. Again, that's not, <laughs> that shouldn't be surprising. Um, all the transaction means is that you're paying for a service, which is a mutually beneficial arrangement. There's nothing wrong. I, I'm, I'm afraid that they're, they're going to start by critiquing education and then it's just going to devolve into very banal anti-capitalism. But moving on. By asking the question, what is education going to need for? this scotch? Hey guys, before I keep going, I want to give a shout out to this video sponsor, Private Internet Access. Okay, well, I'm not sponsored by whatever VPN this is. So, uh, let's uh, move along to the part of the video that seems to be played back quite a bit by everyone skipping the ad. So, let's um, feel free to go ahead and use their code. I have, no, I have nothing against them. I don't use this VPN, but I'm not sponsored by a VPN safe today. And now let's get back to the show. Now, for most of my lifetime, a college degree has been seen as a sort of one-way ticket to the American middle class or better. But recently, it seems like we're all asking if this is actually the case. According to a 2023 Wall Street Journal NORC poll, 56% of Americans agree that a four-year degree is not worth the cost because people often graduate without specific job skills and with a large amount of debt to pay off. Imagine that. The Wall Street Journal also spoke to multiple college graduates who believe that they will be unable to pay back their student loans and that they will not see a return on investment. I've said this on here before, but I just have an insane amount of student loan debt that I'll probably never pay back. The number keeps getting bigger, even as I'm paying. If you want to share your student loan debt number in the comments, feel free. You show me yours and I'll show you mine. Meanwhile, conservative politicians... He, he didn't. But anyway, no, it's, I mean, there are problems with the student loan debt system and he's going to, obviously, I, I can tell already by, as he's inputting Tim Scott, um, I, I'm almost certain that he's going to misdiagnose the problem. And I'll, I'll see if I can do a better job at it. Um, I will say, though, that again, Going to massive debt for a liberal arts education is a very bad idea, really. Uh, unless you have something very specific in mind for which you need that degree. And I mean degree, not education. That's, important that's an important difference. Unless there's something very specific for which you need it, it's, it's not worthwhile. Uh, so for most people. Um, certainly not going into large amounts of debt for it. Uh, now, that said, uh, as, a, as a philosopher, I understand that that means that... <laughs> That my career path is what I'm calling a very bad idea. Um, but of course, I had this discussion with, uh, with some advisors that uh, my, my, uh, my, one of my academic advisors, when I was contemplating going to grad school, trying to become a professor, which I, as I'm doing, uh, is he asked, well, what if, what if you wind up not getting a job in the field at all? Would the time, effort, and money spent still have been worth it to you? And that should realistically answer the question of whether you should pursue whatever your next degree is. Because if it is not helpful to your career, and it would still have been worth pursuing, then it's worth pursuing. Because there's a fairly good chance that it's not going to be beneficial to your career. And so what you should do is you should consider whether it's worthwhile, again, in itself, not as some, uh, as some stepping stone to something further. It's generally good advice. And th this isn't to say, like, don't major in philosophy. You, you definitely should. You should, you should just maybe consider, <clears throat> maybe consider why you are pursuing it. If it is the kind of thing that you would pursue and even pay money for, um, if it didn't stand to help you advance your career or what have you, then go for it. Because I think that I think that a liberal arts degree is worth that if you're capable of if you're in a position to do so, like financial and social position to do so, then then absolutely it is like I said something that I think damn near everyone should do at some point, even if that's not at the traditional eighteen to twenty two years old are increasingly decrying universities for what they perceive as woke indoctrination and professors' ideological agendas. Take the new that that's also true. Yes. Um, Oh, this is a fascinating story, which we'll get to. Uh, I will say that that is, that's, that's demonstrable, really. Um, 
I mean, there are all sorts of there are all sorts of surveys that have been gone out that have gone out. There are all sorts of uh, evaluations of uh, of uh, of college professors' uh, political donations, uh, political affiliations, like official, like documented affiliations, as well as their their sort of self reporting. Uh, and you are, and as far as the numbers go, there are more college professors who identify as Marxist than identify as right leaning in general. That should tell you something. Um, again, all of this is traceable back to the sort of Gramsci and uh, Antonio Gramsci and the, the long march through the institutions that was carried out by the by the broadly Marxist left throughout the 20th century. And uh, again, a lot of the the, the sort of the institutions of uh, what we would call the cathedral uh, that includes that includes uh, media as well as education, especially higher education, are are dominated by the political left and the cultural left, for that matter. Um, that, that doesn't need to be the case. There's no, there's no sort of uh, ideologically deterministic reason for that. It, it is simply something that that was done. It was, a, it was a goal that was accomplished. Um, yes, I do think that is a very common, uh, common bias that you'll find. Although it isn't, it isn't universal. Uh, there are, there are some universities where it's not as common. There are also just, just individuals, such as myself, um, with uh, with different uh, different political inclinations. Given that this is getting into uh, politics, obviously, um, I'm, I'm I can be uh, I'm perfectly willing to be relatively upfront about my my uh, political ideology and such. I'm a I'm a, uh, a what you would probably call a I guess bottom right quadrant, um, broadly speaking, an anarcho capitalist if you want to use the term, voluntarist if you'd rather that term, um, anarcho monarchist if you're being overly uh, if, if I'm, if I'm allowed to be overly idealistic. Um, but I am broadly speaking, right-leaning and I am broadly speaking libertarian. And so those are two incredibly uncommon views within, within higher education, within academia, but not unheard of. And it also depends on your institution as well. There are, uh, there are some other, other people, both, both of the, uh, both of the schools that I teach at where, who share views that are, if not identical to mine, obviously, um, Similar enough, more than you would think uh, in terms of uh, your average college, college professor sort of thing. Um, but again, all that said, I think that there, that there obviously is a sort of left-leaning bias in higher education, clearly. Um, some of those left-leaning professors are interested in what you'd call indoctrination, uh, and a great deal of them uh, so a great deal of them are what you would call woke, but that is also, I think, in higher education, the, 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 the I guess, threat of wokeism is more found in the administration, in the administrative aspects, than it is in the professoriate. Uh, yes, fine, there are woke professors, but professors have, speaking for myself and a lot of my colleagues, we have this tendency to try not to explicitly indoctrinate our, our students. That is beaten the hell out of us throughout <laughs> throughout our own education, and, and so we do tend with again with exceptions who are who are you know, the radical activist types. We tend to uh, guide students, if anything, towards towards ideas that we think are reasonable. Um, but most of us are just as happy to have a a. Uh, brilliant student with a good argument for something we wildly disagree with uh, because they're a bright student with a good argument. I mean, uh, there, there, are, uh, there are relatively few professors who are just resolutely um, ideological, especially in their, uh, in their teaching or their grading. Uh, you get those, but they're rare. So, like I said, I think that the, the, uh, the threat of wokeism, if you want to call it, if you want to call it that, uh, is more in the institutional structure, more in uh, in administrative departments than it is in the professoriate per se, uh, and that's ha that has to do with how the school is run. It has to do with uh, sort of um, standards uh, standards for curricula, standards for hiring, standards for uh, admissions, standards for um, student organizations and and uh, administration of students and things like that. Um, that that it's, uh, it is largely within the administration of the schools where this is a real problem, more so than the professor. Uh, let's get to talking about New College. I've, I've, I've looked into this a little bit. It is, uh, it's relatively nearby me. Um, it's in Florida as well. 
And uh, so it is, uh, this is a, a fascinating development. New College of Florida. Now, when I was going to high school in the Sunshine State, this is where you went if you wanted to go to a state school that would let your freak flag fly. But recently, Governor Meatball Ron DeSantis has been cracking down and adding right-wing activists like Christopher Rufo to the board. Also, I followed Christopher Rufo for quite some time. Um, he is kind of a, you can call him a right-wing activist, that's fine. He, uh, I think he would accept the term, if I'm not mistaken. He's, uh, he has, he does a lot of work concerning, um, now concerning education. Um, but he, he, it's, he's been, if I remember correctly, back, back to my own undergraduate days, uh, he was all, uh, he was all about, um, sort of youth organization, if I remember correctly. Things like Young Americans for Freedom, um, uh, organizations like that. Um, and so, uh, him being involved with new colleges is is, uh, is a really cool development. I don't know why you referred to DeSantis as meatball. Never heard that before. It, incidentally, by the way, uh, Ron DeSantis uh, graduated from my high school about 10, 12 years before I did. So that's pretty cool. Pretty neat. Um, I, I I like a lot of what DeSantis is doing. I I'm uh, I'm unsettled by some of the other things DeSantis is doing. So there are uh, there's some goods and there's some bads. Um, overall, I have a I have an overall positive opinion of him. Um, going a little far afield, I have some trepidations about his uh, about his presidential run, uh, primarily because I think he's I think he's tied a little bit too tightly into the sort of old 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 sort of Bush school of neoconservatism in terms of especially foreign policy. But that's that's completely aside from this. I think what he's doing in terms of education is is largely beneficial. So let's uh, oh, oh, again. We'll see where we go with this. So if you're going to be like, Meatball Ron, Trump says that. You're supporting Trump. No, but he said a funny thing. Sometimes he... Wait, that's a Trump thing? I had no idea. I, I... I have been... I've been mercifully out of the loop of uh, mainstream politics lately. I've been, I've been more... I've been more, honestly, more interested in following um, Vivek Ramaswamy and, uh, and uh, uh, RFK. Fascinating candidates. A little bit of... Uh, of Little, little meatball those because again i do i do think he's done a wonderful job as a job as governor but that's not always necessarily the same thing as presidency but whatever i'm getting too far afield here let's get back to education shall we he says funny stuff if you can't accept that i don't know what to tell you I Trump does say funny stuff. That's true. I did everything right and they indicted me. According to an op-ed by two professors at New College, what the DeSantis administration is trying to do, in brief, is force a conservative Christian model of education onto our public college, attempting to choke out hard-won academic freedom. Freedom was basically invented by the conservative Christian model of education. I don't know what the hell he's talking about here. I mean, I do. I, I think that this is the this is the, sort of the founding myth of modernity. Is that uh, is that what you had in uh, in sort of pre modern times in the Christian West and Christendom, Christian Middle Ages or the Dark Ages or what have you, uh, was education being purely for the sake of indoctrination. And there being no exploration of thought. Well, anyone who studies even the smallest bit of medieval history knows that that is absolutely ridiculous. You can uh, you can know this with near certainty by just looking at anything written at the time and looking at the format. If you look at the format of anything that, say, Donald Aquinas wrote, you'll find a quodlibent, uh, quodlibital questions. That is a back and forth discussion considering alternative possibilities. Uh, arguing against those possibilities, but also arguing for those possibilities. This is the medieval university environment that comes to us today. W why we have universities rather than uh, rather than scolia or um, or academies or what have you, the sort of classical model, uh, the Greek model, if you will. Uh, the reason we have universities as our primary means of higher education, where multiple people with different perspectives in different schools of thought come together and uh, and sort of think together and learn together with their differing points of view, is because that's what you had in the Middle Ages. That the university system developed as a way of uh, of sort of inter um, intermixing scholars from different schools of thought in different places around uh, around the world, or at least around the parts of the world that they had contact with. And we see that going through to this day. Now, what they're doing by contrast, what, what, what they're complaining here, uh, what they think is happening by contrast is 
con- is is what they think DeSantis is trying to do here with this way is they think that DeSantis is trying to implement more like an academy model, which is say the, the academies say of ancient Greece that were set up by a particular school of thought. So by Plato, for for example, had his academy. You go to Plato's academy, you learn Platonism. You don't learn Aristotelianism. You don't learn Stoicism. You don't learn uh, Epicureanism. You learn this particular school of thought. And that's it. You learn you learn one particular view. And that is what they think is going on here. But, I mean, it's clearly and obviously not. The reason they see this as a, as a threat is because they have a, a very particular worldview. And the presence of... I have to be careful with this. A, a learning environment that allows for the presence of alternative red conservative views is seen by them as introducing, not just introducing, engendering, pun not intended, dangerous ideas. They are, uh, again, the people objecting to this are directly ideological. Those are those, those narrow few deeply ideological kinds of people. Where I think that they are they're disturbed by the possibility of um, alternative perspectives being, uh, let's say, students being exposed to alternative perspectives as something other than a straw man. Of course, this agenda is not lost in the critically thinking students at New College. Okay. Okay, this is just, again, um, talking about students complaining, which, I mean, if you, like you said, students of New College are, are have a reputation for rabid leftism. But, I mean, so do students at almost any college. Um, because you know, young college people tend to lean extremely left. Um, especially at public universities, and uh, especially at a, a university like New College. Okay, yeah. Okay, let's see what more. Those are, again, I think that, in summary, this speaks more to the ideological uh, commitments of the people complaining than it does to what, uh, what DeSantis et al. are attempting to implement here. Freedom. And DeSantis has created new rules about what can be taught at state universities that have led some professors to stop teaching courses dealing with questions of race and gender, and some to lose or leave their positions. DeSantis ties the themes of economic viability and ideological control together in a recent speech announcing his ban on college diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI department. Okay, um, oh wait, hold on. Let me go back a second. Let me, let's go back over this. There might be something interesting about this. DeSantis has created new rules about what can be taught at state universities that have led some professors to stop teaching courses dealing with questions of race and gender, and some okay. that has lead that has led professors to stop teaching courses dealing with race and gender. What that means is that these professors have been teaching these courses with a particular perspective and teaching that perspective as normative. Because that is what these bills prohibit. This is them telling on themselves. Because if this law would interrupt your ability to teach, what that means is that you were attempting to teach, uh, first of all, uh, I'll just say, first of all, a false view of the world, but that's separate. I mean, if you're, if you're wanting to propose and, and, and teach about a false view of the world, you can do that because you might think it's true. And even if you don't think it's true, it might be something worth learning about from a sort of external perspective. But more directly, it is teaching it as the, uh, the, the, the norm by which or the standard by which um, other ideological systems ought to be judged. That's the problem. And that is precisely what, uh, what at least apparently, a lot of the professors here concerned about this are doing. When, so when we say t- courses about race and gender, what they mean are, say, um, not just teaching about race or teaching about gender, but teaching critical race theory uh, or or uh, queer theory, etc. Um, these are specific 
Uh, these are specific viewpoints that are being put forward here, uh, rather than uh, not just put forward, but being actively taught, uh, rather than uh, simply a course about a subject. Let's put a uh, let's put an inverted spin on this again. Like apply this to my particular situation. Um, if I were concerned uh, that I wouldn't be able to teach my the courses I'm uh, I, the way I ordinarily do, um, let's put it this way: when I teach philosophy of religion, typically uh, I do so at a Catholic university. It, at, uh, I've I've yet to teach philosophy of religion uh, not at Saint Leo. I haven't taught it at USF. I haven't taught it anywhere else. If I were being told to teach it that, say, for example, if I were being told at, say, University of South Florida that my syllabus were unacceptable, that I needed to change the way I was teaching because this is a secular university and I cannot be uh, proselytizing or I cannot be uh, promoting a Catholic perspective or, or explicitly teaching a Catholic perspective or something like that, what that would say is that my syllabus is from a specifically Catholic perspective, which it is because I'm teaching at a Catholic university. What these professors are doing is they are teaching from a specifically critical, uh, a critical theory perspective. Because they are teaching at critical theory universities. And so what's going on is that we are, we are sort of de-ideologizing uh, the university. We are, in a sense, secularizing the university. Um, making it a, uh, a place of in the interchange of ideas rather than teaching from a particular perspective. Um, something like that. On a bit, because there's something else interesting here. Come to lose or leave their positions. DeSantis ties the themes of economic viability and ideological control together in a recent speech announcing his ban on college diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI departments. Departments. Not subjects. Not content. Departments. Uh, that is absolutely good, and that this this speaks to, first of all, what I said earlier about uh, the problem being primarily in uh, in administration rather than in the professoriate. Because what he's talking about here, banning of DEI departments, those departments are administrative departments. Those are not a those are not academic departments. That there is no there is no uh, academic department of diversity, equity, and inclusion. No, there is a university office of diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is what is being, uh, being, at least last I heard was only being proposed as being removed from, uh, from state universities. Uh, but if, if that's been passed, then huzzah, uh, because good, because that is a serious problem. And it's a, it's a, it's a the detriment on one professor's ability to teach and two students ability, uh, students, um, ability to learn that they're um the environment conducive to learning let's say so yeah i think that that if we're if we're if we're actually reading it carefully or listening i guess carefully to what's being said here uh yeah of course yeah he's this is not an objection to what anyone's teaching this is an objection to how the universities are being managed absolutely now i have other objections to uh to teaching critical theory and such um, because I think that the, the ideas therein are not just wrong, but but obviously wrong and incoherent. And so I don't. I think that that so this way. I think that people who think that the that these ideas hold water are not worth listening to. Uh, but that is realistically that is a the kind of thing that a, a university should decide upon, or even students should decide upon uh, to at least some degree. Uh, that isn't really a, that, that is something to be decided in the marketplace of ideas, let's say. Uh, the problem, of course, being that, that you know, these DEI departments, these administrative DEI departments uh, are largely, uh, it, are very closely tied in with human resources departments, in other words, hiring and firing decisions. And so these, these almost laughably bad ideas have uh, an inordinate amount of support from the administrative structure of the university in most places. And so they can survive the the crucible of uh, of the marketplace of ideas because that crucible has been temperature has been turned down significantly.
if you look at the way this has actually been implemented across the country, uh, DEI is, is better um, viewed as standing for discrimination, exclusion, and indoctrination. And that has no place in our public institutions. In reference to the field of gender That's studies, right. DeSantis asked, how, how employable are you with some of these majors? And declared, we want to focus on the classical mission of what a university is supposed to be. Now, we've talked about this before, but in recent years, universities, or at least their board members and administrators, seem to think that the mission of college is largely just job training. I'm curious as to whether that is what DeSantis meant there, but I, I would think he would, cause he's, he's a well-educated guy. Uh, he's, he has a good classical education as far as I know, and he, he smart, right? He's well, like well-educated as well. So I would think that he would realize that that is that job training, so to speak, is not the classical mission of the university. I would think he would know that. So I'm suspicious about the use of that that clip from the speech. I have to assume that, well, I don't know. I strongly suspect that he meant something other than we should keep universities as job training, something like that. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm a, a crumb of context would be helpful, but, uh, let me see. No citations. I was afraid of that. All right, well. This is why I put citations in, in the bottom of my, my YouTube descriptions. Because if I were to include a clip like that, I would include the te the, either the text uh, or a link to the full speech. Because I'm a competent and responsible scholar. Anyway, let's back up a sec. Let's see. The classical mission of what a university is supposed to be. Now, we've talked about this before, but in recent years, universities, or at least their board members and administrators, seem to think that the mission of college is largely just job training. Marymount University in Virginia has announced its plans to cut majors in English, philosophy, history, and sociology, aka the subjects that we use in basically every wisecrack video. Now, according to journalist Nick Anderson, this move shows the continuing vulnerability of humanities in higher education at a time when pressure is high to deliver degrees that many students and families perceive as more valuable in the job market. In case you're wondering, I care a lot about this because I was a humanities professor for a lot of years. I taught philosophy at universities and i got out before it got real crazy but it makes you sad to look back at a field that you loved and see what's happening to it so uh what's gotten real i don't know what's gotten real crazy is it the stem obsession because the stem obsession is a it's kind of a problem but it's not it's not a real not a problem problem um i, I will say in terms of like department funding like so again inside baseball kind of stuff like philosophy professor to philosophy professor here uh or whatever he taught i don't know I assume it's philosophy, but something tells me English. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, if we're talking strictly... So the only issue that I've, I've that has ever really come to my attention as far as, uh, as, far as actual policy decisions on university, uh, at universities, uh, where this sort of STEM obsession, uh, this, this job training kind of mentality really affects anything, aside from, I guess, Merrimont, uh, getting rid of majors, which that's a particular university, which, I mean, that's bad, but it's, it's anecdotal. Then again, I'm about to put forward anecdotes, but it, it seems to me at least that the only place where this is a real problem is for departmental funding, where, uh, where, you know, STEM departments have a tendency to attract a lot more funding, um, than say humanities departments, but also they need more funding. Like, just practically speaking, like, I can conduct all of the research for uh, a philosophy publication, and all I need is library access. That's it. Time and library access. And I can conduct all the research necessary for a philosophy publication. A top-tier publication. I can teach a course on philosophy very competently with books which are kind of expensive but not they don't even have to be um ideally some server space because a course website is helpful but not necessary i could go without it if i needed to i could go without a course website just fine and some chairs but even that is optional i would uh, i would i would do just fine teaching a course with uh myself standing and my students sitting around me on the floor 
I could, in fact, utilize the technology that was available to Socrates, <laughs> or maybe let's say Plato, because he taught formal classes. Uh, I could use the technology that was available to Plato and teach a perfectly adequate philosophy class. You can't do that with a science lab. If you're doing, if you're teaching science, especially at the high, at the higher end of the university level, you need advanced equipment. You need access to sophisticated technology. Uh, you need funding in a way that we frankly don't. And yeah, that's not a, not a self, uh, not a benefit, not a self beneficial thing for me to say, but it's absolutely true. The biggest funding for humanities majors is travel. And even that is barely necessary. That's just to go to conferences, and that's, I mean, nice, but it's nice. It's kind of helpful for, for research purposes and networking purposes, but it's not, even that is not strictly necessary. Uh, like, so the funding disparity is, yes, it, it does represent a, uh, I think, it, I think a, and overall, a bad, uh, a bad trend in terms of uh, what we emphasize as more important in our education. Sure, fine, but also that funding disparity makes perfect sense given the things that that funding is going towards. So, again, uh, not to self disparage too much or disparage my own department too much, but we don't need the kind of money that a science department does. We we really don't. Anyway. Solidarity to all my fellow uh, current past and present humanities professors out there. I'd give you something Cheers. if we could. We have nothing to give. Now, it's not shocking that Americans and increasingly That's folks true. around oh, the world have a that. dollars and cents attitude towards the educational system. Yeah, it's not just an American thing. When I taught in England, we had to teach people how to write resumes in a class on Kant's third critique. It was crazy. And one of the reasons I left, along with crippling depression. But wh what? On, class on Kant's third critique? What? Th this sounds like... This sounds like one of those uh, extracurricular things that the professor does to help students out to me, more than like part of the actual curriculum. This is like how my senior my senior year in in high school uh, Spanish my advanced place my advanced placement Spanish class, um, our teacher had to teach the majority of the class with my help uh, how to write in cursive uh, because we were we were reading uh, letters we were reading like handwritten letters in Spanish, and uh, most of, and a lot of the class could not read or write cursive. We had to learn this. That seems like the kind of thing that he's talking about here, that this is something that, oh, well, that's an interesting thing that you don't know here. Let me, let me teach you. Um, this does not seem like a, like it would be a, a curriculum, a part of the actual curriculum, but I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe that is, abs maybe that is just absolutely insane, but I don't know. That does sound insane to me. If I, if I, if I, to teach my students how to write a resume, I, I might, I might also be tempted to. Anyway, what if this cash rules everything around me attitude is also affecting the way that we view educational practice and learning itself? Okay, so to take Meatball Ron at his word, what is the classical mission of education? Well, it doesn't get that much more classical than Aristotle, and for him, the ancient. I'm suspicious here. But like I was saying earlier, what we think of as the classical model of education is not exclusively classical Greek, not even primarily classical Greek. Um, the classical liberal arts education developed in the Middle Ages. Uh, yes, it integrated the thought of Plato and it integrated the thought of Aristotle, uh, but it was part of the medieval synthesis, not simply a sort of recapturing of the classical Greek world. So I am a little bit, we, we should be a little bit careful differing straight to Aristotle about the classical use for education. Now, maybe, maybe this is useful. Maybe this is good. Maybe this is something to, to keep in mind, but again, caveat. This word, what is the classical mission of education? Well, it doesn't get that much more classical than Aristotle. And for him, the aim of education is to cultivate character. Because education uh, is directly yeah. connected to politics, those with a cultivated character will also become virtuous and well-informed citizens. This was basically his pitch for creating a functional democracy. Because seriously, imagine a world where the only education that matters is like STEM subjects that get you jobs, and then you have to vote in elections, and you know nothing about politics, history, philosophy, religion, all these things that matter so much, and what it means to be a political human, and you're just like, I don't know, I have computer money. Now, for Aristotle, education prepares students to be good citizens who think freely. Rather than being overly influenced by their passions or the opinions of others. It also entails being aware of a variety of positions, even those you might not naturally be inclined to agree with. And okay, so there's there's nuance to this, but but yeah, I think that that is that is uh, okay. Absolutely solid foundation, good so far. 
all that was great. I, I, I solidly agree with all that. Now, the, the point about Aristotle uh, talking about ideas that you may not agree with, kind of. Um, Aristotle was not exactly a big fan of, of say, robust debate in the same sense that the, the later universities were, uh, with different ideas actually coming into contact and therefore conflict with each other. Uh, because, like I said, Arist like I was saying, the, the classical Greeks, Aristotle included, had their own uh, their own academies, their own uh, their own schools where they taught their own school of thought. Uh, but Aristotle did say that that one line, which I won't quite get right, I I, I don't know offhand, but uh, a rough paraphrase, uh, that it's it's the work, it's the mark of wisdom to be able to to hold an idea in one's mind without accepting it or without being overcome by it or something like that. That. Uh, to be able to understand an idea, to really understand an idea, to fully comprehend it, as if you as if you believed it, without actually believing it, uh, that is a, a serious mark of wisdom. Now, uh, this is this is something that I've uh, I've been kind of arguing a lot about lately, especially on, in uh, especially in our Discord server. Which, if you're not in there, feel free to join. It's right down, right down there, right in, li right in link in the description. Join our Discord server. A lot of fun. We talk about this kind of stuff. Um, but. I think that there is a difference between teaching an alternative perspective as a viable candidate for truth, which it may not be, versus teaching an alternative perspective as a means to understand what someone else thinks. Now, you can do that. You can do the latter. You can learn from an alternative perspective without without actually taking it on, without actually thinking that it's true. You can you can learn from an alternative perspective what uh, you can learn things about the people who hold that perspective. Uh, I've been talking about this a lot in in terms of religion, say right, because being Catholic, I hold that Catholicism Catholicism is true. I hold all of the the doctrines and dogma, dogmas of Catholicism with absolute certainty. All of that. Um, however, I'm capable of understanding what Protestants believe. I'm capable of understanding what pagans believe. I'm capable of understanding what atheists believe. Uh, but not as if it were possible that those perspectives were true, because it's not. I mean, part of part of believing what you believe is knowing that alternatives are are false. But part of part of knowing something is knowing that the converse is false, right? But it's very important to understand what the converse is, so you can understand, uh, so you can first of all better understand what you do believe, what your what your views actually are. But then understand um, what other perspectives there are, something about the people who hold those perspectives, and then also to uh, to sharpen iron with iron, so to speak, right? To to further refine and develop your own ideas, you have to look at what perspectives are out there, which ones are implausible, and so we can either move on from them or draw something from them, uh, draw something that isn't so implausible from them, say. So again, this is this is the nuance here. This is the, the important nuance of how we ought to uh, to take on or to to learn about alternative perspectives is not as not necessarily as you know, perusing the options of what we might want to believe, but rather uh, looking at uh, the things that people have believed and the things that people do believe and uh, seeing what we can learn from from the fact that they they believe these things and learn from uh, the insights that they gain, uh, say the different emphases or something like that, or that that sort of thing. Because I, I if there's one thing that I can't stand about how a lot of philosophy is taught, and for that matter, how a lot of religion is taught, it's not as if there are these various schools of thought and that we, as as sort of independent, uh, independent observer thinkers, are hovering over all of them until we decide to accept one of them, uh, after having perused all of them, right? Especially ethics, right? Ethics is really this is really common in ethics, and this is one of the major criticisms that say uh, somebody like um, uh, somebody like uh, Alistair McIntyre has of uh, how we do ethics in the modern world. Is that we have we 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 put forward these schools of thought. We put forward deontology and utilitarianism and virtue theory and ethics of care and uh, and uh, reductionism and right and we have all of these laid before us and we have to observe all of them, learn what we can from of each of these theories and then decide which we think is likely to be correct. Well, 
that's ridiculous. That is absolutely not the situation we ever find ourselves in. You never, ever find yourself in this sort of position of indifference before alternative possibilities of the schools of thought. You rather find yourself always already thinking in a certain way. And then what you can do, therefore, is look into these different aspects of that, that way of thinking. Say you can look into the consequentialist aspects of it, or you can look into the, the, the uh, law-like regularities aspect of it, so the sort of deontological aspects of it. Look into the development of virtues and see how that impacts the way that you, the way that you are developing ethical ideas. But sort of working from a position that you're already in, rather than this sort of abstract looking at the various possibilities as if they are, you know, as if we are indifferent to them from the outset. We're not indifferent to various possibilities from the outset. That's ridiculous. Same goes for religious ideas. Same goes with other philosophical schools of thought. Same goes with everything. There, there, there is no sort of original position uh, to borrow the term. So again, that's, that's, again, a lot of nuance to go into a lot of correct things that he had to say from Aristotle, but a lot of nuance that I think is, is important, at least in the abstract, and may wind up being important to what else he has to say. I don't know. I haven't seen this yet. America, it's common to think of education as a means to an end, not an end in itself. Meaning that the point of an education isn't to be educated, it's to use that education to make money. This is because our society likes to tell us that self-actualization and happiness don't come from character or virtue, but from career success and earning potential. And to be fair to those who think education is primarily a path to wealth, earning a college degree does offer some advantages. According who thinks that? Like, is this, is this a Protestant thing? This feels like it might be a Protestant thing. Hmm. You know what? I think I can safely blame the Protestants for this. Uh, and I can say that because I can ask what the word vocation means. And you'll get two radically different answers from a sort of broadly American secular Protestant versus a Catholic. A uh, Catholic, your vocation is uh, which of the... Um, which sacrament are you receiving? Holy orders or matrimony? That's what vocation means. And that is, of course, what you are called to, literally, vocation. Uh, or, I mean, in the terms that we've been just using here, that is where we, that is where we, I hate to use the phrase self-actualize, because it sounds so wishy-washy, but that's where we, that's where we, um, our vocation in that sense, our, our, our relationship to, uh, to God, to community, and to family, right? that is, uh, that is what, what, um, what develops our character sufficient like to to the degree that we actually become fully ourselves say uh, whereas if you ask about a vocation uh in protestant circles uh and then uh, as well in sort of secular american circles you'll be you'll be it'll be assumed that you're talking about uh, a job right or a career hence vocational studies or vocational school or vocational training right that's, I mean, vocational training, if in a Catholic, from a Catholic perspective, is seminary or pre cana. It's not, you know, tech school. So I think that, I think that, yeah, I think that this is a, a difference in perspective where I think that there is a, a problem, perhaps, with some sectors of our culture, at least, thinking that we do get our sort of, our self definition from our career, from, uh, from, how did he put it? He, he, he made some jab at making money, I think, but let's let's go back and see a bit, and then uh, then we can. In itself, meaning that the point of an education isn't to be educated; it's to use that education to make money. This is because our society likes to tell us that self-actualization and happiness don't come from character or virtue, but from career success and earning potential. And to be okay, career success and earning potential. Okay, earning potential. No, uh, I don't think that's that's even that is is wonky because I don't think there there's really anybody. Yeah, I don't think there's really anybody who would say that your 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 self-actualization and happiness are determined by your earning potential and your career path. That's that's an incredibly narrow perspective that you won't find outside of like Manhattan. That that also seems to kind of be a cultural lefty thing to some degree, at least an off left, sort of authoritarian left rather than the, the sort of weird hippie left. I don't know. It seems like a very very niche perspective. Yes, I can see the whole like your your identity is formed by your career that perspective, which 
which I disagree with, certainly. I think that's wrong. I think that that's, that's, a, that's the wrong way of approaching things. But, but having it defined by earning potential, I think that that's, that's a very narrow perspective. Very narrow perspective. That's not, not, I don't think that's very common. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, this, maybe there are a lot of people who wrap their entire value into making lots and lots of money, but I think that that's, that's extremely rare. Fair to those who think education is primarily a path to wealth, earning a college degree does offer some advantages. According to journalist Jessica Dickler, bachelor's degree holders generally earn 75% more than those with just a high school diploma. So it makes sense for American students, parents, universities, and even politicians to prioritize job training and earning potential when considering the value of a college education. But of course, this clashes with the classic Aristotelian model in which education is a preparation for life and not just a necessary evil on your way to the C-suite. Now, somewhat ironically, considering recent debates, many of the banned subjects, basically anything to do with race, gender, or critical theory, are considered Wait, race, gender, critical theory. You just ironically that in considering recent debates, many of the banned with, subjects uh, basically, okay. basically anything to do with race, race gender, gender, or critical th or critical theory. Race, gender, critical theory. You see any of those on there? Let's just go through this. Theology, nothing to do with any of those at all. Uh, there is a very minor school of critical theology. Um, but it's but it's not taken seriously by like anybody, even even its own adherents, because most critical theorists who study theology are deconstructive about it. They don't actually take theology seriously. Uh, okay, so history. There are critical theorists in history, but they're a minority still. Thank God. Um, that's maybe changing, but they're still largely a minority. Uh, race. There is there is history of race relations, but that's only really a, a, a only really in the narrow subfield of American history, there's very little history of race relations, uh, like academically speaking, outside of American history. Um, gender, yeah, there's history of gender courses, but again, that's a very odd modern development. Um, and again, that's, that's only, what he's talking about here is a critical gender theorist or a queer theorist approach to historiography, which again is still, thank God, a minority perspective uh, in the field, at least, at least to the degree that I'm familiar with the field. Now I haven't been I haven't been that involved with higher higher levels of the history field for a couple of years, so since like 2018 or so, so it's possible that in the last four or five years there's been a radical sea change. There are a bunch of critical theorists in academic history, but it's certainly not synonymous. Um, the arts, race, gender, and critical theory. The arts. I mean, a lot of artists tend to tend to take that sort of ideological position, but it's not. It has nothing to do with their actual subject area. Um, math. Dear God, why? I'll just defer to James Lindsay, who is who is academically speaking, he's a mathematician, that unless you're really off the deep end, has like nothing to do with any of it. Uh, English, you're getting closer. Still nothing to do with race or gender. Uh, not really. Um, but critical theory uh, does have some roots in, uh, in literature, the study of literature. So maybe there's something there, but, but, but again, you and absolutely teach English without anything to do with any of those subjects, let alone um, sort of wokest indoctrination of those subjects. So again, I think that I think that he's reading way too much into this. Uh, maybe reading his own perspective into this, which is a bit dangerous. Do with race, gender, or critical theory are consistent with the intellectual and social goals of classical education. Because no, they're not. Okay, going further. Those subjects which are aligned, which have to do with race, gender, and critical theory, are absolutely not aligned with uh, the goals of classical education because they are, uh, so say, critical race theory, queer theory, and critical theory in general um, are fundamentally and by their own, uh, by their own admission, are opposed to the classical tradition. They're opposed to classical forms of education, classical pedagogy. Uh, they are opposed to uh, to classical literature, um, and they're opposed to classical schools of thought in general. Uh, they are they are strictly 
uh, in opposition to everything everything about a classical form of education. Now, if he just means that uh, that studying race, gender, and critical theory is going to be conducive to becoming a uh, uh, an informed citizen, then that is immensely question begging. Because that just not even question begging, really. That's just revelative of uh, of his assumptions here. That that. That there is a particular perspective, a political perspective that is leftism, uh, sort of modern post-Marxian leftism, that is, uh, or I guess post-structuralist leftism, that is the correct political perspective, and to and to learn about that perspective is to uh, is to develop yourself into a proper, you know, democratic citizen. Well, okay, we know where you stand politically. I mean, as if we didn't already, but. But again, this is this is purely from a uh, from a, a purely from a an ideological standpoint. Because again, if I, I could I could perfectly well just I could just as well say that well, you'll notice that uh, something missing from this list is economics, and that if you're not, uh, I think I would actually honestly say this: if you're not well informed on economics, you have no business voting. You have no business governing because politics is ultimately, I would argue, reducible to ethics and economics. And in particular, I would say uh, not just economics broadly, which, yes, helpful. Any school of economics is going to be helpful in understanding political matters. But I would say the Austrian school in particular, praxeology, is absolutely necessary to the study and understanding of politics and, the, and, for, and to, say, political participation. Like, all of that is, if you're not studying economics, then you're not going to be a, a functioning political citizen. Okay, cool. That's an ideological perspective. You can tell, you can tell my political beliefs based on the fact that I say that. You can tell almost certainly that I'm a right-leaning libertarian of some of some variety when I say economics, especially Austrian praxeology, is necessary for uh, becoming a uh, well-developed political citizen. So yeah, again, I think that. Uh, and now I will add to that ethics because I think if you don't study ethics to a really significant degree, then you're not you're not going to be able to. to be a political participant in any meaningful sense, other than, you know, doing this kind of stuff, which requires no thought whatsoever. Um, again, I think both of those are absolutely necessary, but that's, that's again, nothing to do with race, gender, or critical theory. Also, this, this kid is just staring deeply into the and or our souls. Let's move on. When students understand things like racism, patriarchy, sexuality, and ideology critique more generally, they can so when they take a particular uh, leftist, post-structuralist, uh, critical perspective, in other words. So when they are leftists, you're saying. Better evaluate whether or not society is actively furthering the common good. And so what he's saying is that, that the common good is determined by leftist political values. Moving on. And critically about inequality and injustice. No. Let me go back a second. Or evaluate whether or not society is actively furthering the common good. And think critically about inequality and injustice. Critical thinking is explicitly rejected by critical theory, by critical pedagogy. Uh, what, is, what is referred to as critical thinking, which is again, uh, refer, which goes back to Aristotle, funny enough, um, is the idea of, uh, of examining something uh, by, by examining its constituent parts and seeing how they fit together into a, into a particular, into a, uh, into a whole. Right, the the parts relationship to the whole, uh, and understanding the the, uh, the 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 structure of something. So the the critical theory, the critical theorist approach, which is uh, the the sort of post structuralist critical theorist approach, critical pedagogy, if we're using the in in sort of educational terms, that is explicitly opposed to what has classically been called critical uh, thinking. Uh, because its purpose is not to examine the constituent parts and examine uh, examine uh, how they work together and examine uh, what what is what ought to be in the classical mode of, of understanding things. Uh, but critical pedagogy is instead associative. It is about looking at things uh, what they would term holistically. Uh, so looking at the whole and disregarding the parts, looking at the whole and comparing the whole to uh, to other thoughts and other uh, other. Uh, other abstracts, other concepts, rather than uh, rather than 
what you would think of as the sort of dissection approach of, of critical thinking. So no, critical theory is not conducive to critical thinking. It is explicitly opposed to critical thinking in a lot of its core literature. I don't know if our wisecrack here is ignorant of this or, and, and so is just sort of duped by, by the term, uh, or is a, so, so I don't know if he's a useful idiot or if he's a true believer, but I, I could see it going either way. Troublingly. But of course, at this point, some want to have their classical education cake without actually having any idea what a classical education consists of. For example, while it critiques humanities and social science professors for perpetuating an agenda, the Florida government is busy promoting their own ideological agenda. And real quick, if any Floridian... Okay, hold on. Before he gets to talking, talking to Floridians, self-included, um, go ask, a, uh, go ask your, your average leftist, particularly a left-leaning left educator, what they think of a classical education. Go ahead. See what you get. Because I guarantee they will not be supportive of a uh, classical curriculum. Absolutely not. Uh, in fact, we've been looking into things like classical curricula for, for, for our kids, for, for homeschooling, uh, which, again, it's a little early for this sort of thing because, because kindergarten, um, our oldest is, just getting into, is about to get into kindergarten, but, but a classical educational model the only people supporting a classical educational model these days are, I hate to say it, but pretty much just religious fundamentalists, um, ourselves included, or, I mean, fundamentalist enough, Catholic fundamentalist if you want, I don't know, whatever, are, are what these people, what, not, maybe not him particularly, but the, the people, you know, marching and chanting, or the, the, uh, the, the left-leaning educators, what they would... I guarantee, think of as uh, right-wing extremists. This is the only people who actually will, will be going through and using a classical curriculum and education uh, and would, would ever dream of supporting such a thing. So no, I don't, he's, I think he's mixing this up pretty severely. Professors for perpetuating an agenda, the Florida government is busy promoting their own ideological agenda. And real quick, if any Floridians think I'm unfairly picking on your state, I'm speaking from lived experience. I lived there for a while. I went to school in Florida. This is a product of the Florida public education system. So, you know, think before you, you get defensive, okay? I'm critiquing from a place of confused love. Also, your state looks like a wiener. For example, state provided education materials include slides that said it was a misconception that the founding fathers wanted strict separation of church and state, and that they, in fact, wanted religion to be promoted. That's just strictly true. I mean, that is strictly true. Um, Okay, so again, we all know the whole separation of church and state thing was uh, was a letter from Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Baptist Church, and it was basically promising their church that they would be protected from the state, not that the state would be protected from the church or the churches. There was never anything like that. There was never any implication that that uh, that there would be no uh, no influence upon the actions of the state by uh, by religious religious motivations let's say now there were in law in many places protections from uh the institutional church because there was a lot of anti-catholicism in the founding era of them that's true i'll give you that they didn't want influence from rome per se uh, or even from bishops really um but no the this idea that uh that that there should be a separation between secular politics and religious ideas it is absurd, primarily just because the idea of, uh, of religion as a set of propositions or a set of motivations is a, is a very strange, uh, very recent phenomenon. Um, so, again, I think that, this, that what he's criticizing here, right, it, it was a misconception. The Founding Fathers wanted a strict separation of church and state, and they, in fact, wanted religion to be promoted. Yeah, all of that's just true. Um, there were a few founding fathers who were anti, who were against religion, um, but actually, no. I mean, unless you count Thomas Paine as a founding father, which I don't know if I would. Um, John Locke wasn't really against religion, but he thought that it needed to be uh, subsumed into and directed towards the purposes of the state. And I mean, Lockeans, including Jefferson, had something like that idea, but but not that it needed to be but yeah still that it should be promoted that that a uh, constitution was uh, was drafted for a uh, 
or fundamentally religious people. It is uh, incapable of the governance of any other or something, something very close to that. That was, uh, I think, George Washington, right? American history is not my forte. Um, but I know enough to say that, yeah, no, that's that's just strictly, that's all strictly correct. There's nothing wrong about that at all. The same slides mention that the founding fathers were against slavery, even though they own slaves, they own slaves, but I guess. Yeah, most of them were against slavery. In fact, that was, a, that was the majority position. Um, the compromises in the uh, in the Constitution were were in order to uh, to keep keep the Southern states in the Union, basically to get them into the Union. Uh, and a lot of them, uh, even Jefferson, uh, who was well known as as uh, as uh, owning slaves, um, was fundamentally opposed to the institution. Um, was uh, was known for uh, for freeing his slaves by the end of his life. Was, uh, all all these sorts of things. Uh, again, you cannot necessarily judge someone's ideas based on their actions because we're we are imperfect, fallen men, right? Uh, because again, he may may have been you know say making excuses for not freeing his slaves, like the uh, like the difficulty of doing so. Legally speaking, the uh, um, the, the 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 harm it may cause them to suddenly be freed, even uh, which again may not be strictly true, but it may have been a sort of post hoc rationalization because you know what it's it's difficult to make a very very significant change to one's lifestyle, uh, even if you know it's the right thing to do. So yeah, they probably did know that it was the right thing to do. Of course, like even even the founders who owned slaves. Um, the vast majority of them were fundamentally against the institution. Um, they just were tempted into what they even acknowledged as wrongful behavior. I guess they were against it. Great opponent's brains. And invented cocaine. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. These folks are worried about authoritarianism in education, in which teachers affected with the woke mind virus indoctrinate students with dangerous ideas, like uh, some people are gay, or enslaved people built much of this country, or a... Uh... Okay. Uh, some people are gay. That's interesting because I, I oddly enough disagree. Um, I'll put a link in the description to a uh, to an article that really fundamentally changed my view of the matter called "Against Heterosexuality," uh, and the point of which is that that gay as an identifier is a confused category um, because it's either talking about uh, a a sort of fundamental self identification, which is just circular. Uh, or it's talking about an inclination, which might be the case, but it is not in any way immutable, is not in any way exclusive, is not in any way um, formal. It, it doesn't have to do with one's form. It is, it is a uh, it is a a defect in order, not in form. Uh, again, I'll put a I'll put a link in the description to where I talk about the distinction between, between form and order of something. The form of something is is uh, is uh, what it. What it is to be that sort of thing. The order of something is the orientation of one's particular parts to that form. Um, and so again, that the the disordered sexual desires are disordered in the sense that they are oriented not towards the completion of the whole, but towards something at, uh, towards something else, uh, towards something lower, something they ought not to be ordered towards. Uh, so again, the, the idea of, of some people are gay that either just means some people have certain te certain temptations. And may either struggle with them or embrace them, or it might mean that they sort of pridefully, funny enough, uh, identify with uh, or identify as something which is overall not a coherent category. Um, the fact that enslaved people built uh, large portions of this nation that has this really nasty implication that slavery uh, was good, and it wasn't. Right. This implies right, the, the whole 1619 project, which is what he's referring to here. Um, the idea that slaves built this country or whatever. The idea there is that uh, slavery was the economic boon that allowed capitalism to develop, particularly in the, in the United States, but throughout the industrial West. And that couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, it was an impediment. Again, slavery, by its very nature, is economically inefficient uh, because it is it is. It is a strictly win-lose arrangement. It is not strictly win-win, uh, which is what you will find in free exchange. It is it is just like government action, necessarily an inefficiency, uh, because it has all of the calculation issues. It has uh, it has all sorts of uh, has uh, issues of um, 
even just from an economic perspective, by not treating the slaves as people, you're not you're not interacting with them as as people. And so they are they are out of your economy. This is a this is a large group of people who are prevented from participating in normal human society. And so normal human society is that much worse off for it. Everyone should acknowledge this because everyone should be opposed to slavery. But even though these people are nominally opposed to slavery, they still want to hang on to this idea that slavery was this huge benefit to the nation, which is absurd. It's absolutely ridiculous. And, and if I were them, I might even say it's offensive. But I'm not disingenuous like that. I don't, it, it's obviously wrong, though, and they should acknowledge it as such. Uh, Judy Bloom wrote some cool books. Also, if you haven't watched it, there's a Judy Bloom documentary out right now. Why slave oh, people yeah. built much of this country. Or uh, Judy Bloom wrote some Judy Bloom? The book. I don't actually know anything by Judy Bloom. This is this is going over my head. I apologize. Um, I know about the controversy about rewriting the rewriting a lot of classic literature, like changing words, phrases, descriptions. I think that's that's absurd. Very dangerous. Again, link in the description. Um, Somebody I greatly respect on the subject, The Critical Drinker, had a really good video on it. That'll be down there. Some cool books. Also, if you haven't watched it, there's a Judy Bloom documentary out right now. Watch it the other night. Amazing. A huge Judy Bloom head now. And here, they're at least kind of correct. In so much as the American education system really is set up to indoctrinate students, just not in the way that they think. And right-wing worries that left-wing opinions can be instilled by force as if downloaded through a brain implant indicates a misunderstanding of how learning works in the first place. This understanding of education in which teachers just sort of like drop facts and information into a student's brain box as if they're being deposited into a bank is what Brazilian philosopher and educator Paulo Freire called the banking model of education. In this model, students are seen oh. as piggy banks. And teachers are kids with pockets full of nickels. According to Ferry, when teachers are thought of as bank clerks, he also calls them uh, domesticators and prescribers, there is no real sense of teacher-student partnership. Rather than a hierarchical relationship between educator and student, he thinks education should operate with a more Socratic model, in which teacher and student operate on a similar level, in which teachers are open to learning from their students. This is why, according to Ferry... Okay, so, to a degree, yes. I learn a lot from my students, but not in my subject area. <laughs> Uh, quite frankly, the only thing I learn in, in my subject area from my students is something that is, is on a very rare occasion that they, that a student has read something I haven't, which happens, in which case I learn, I learn it in the relatively traditional way. Um, or in my subject area, if a student brings up an issue that I hadn't thought to, to consider or to do research or whatnot, that sort of thing. And I have to go and learn more for the sake of my students. That's really the only time I learn philosophy from my students. Now, I learn other things from my students all the time. And I'm, I always am very upfront about this. And it is that, like most academics, I'm hyper-specialized. I know a lot. I know a lot about a little bit. <laughs> and because I'm teaching other budding academics, undergraduate students, um, they are also budding specialists. They all know a lot about their various subject areas, their majors, their minors, and their interests. And so when I, when I bring something up, I will often, very often, defer to my students who probably know something about, say, the hard sciences that I haven't studied since high school. Things like that. And I learn things from my students, perfectly willing to, and I love to. But it's about things outside of my expertise. There actually is a role for expertise, believe it or not. That's that's a real thing. A real thing. It's actually quite useful. What Fieri, I believe, is talking about is a is not a Socratic model because this is the idea that it is that teaching is a kind of conversation that we learn together, which is which is the 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 sort of play acting model that Socrates used and that we can use sort of following Socrates. But the idea there is to, to guide students along to, uh, to learn something sort of on their own, to come up with the ideas, but to show them the pathway to coming up with the ideas. That's what the, the Socratic method is really doing. It's not me and my students kind of walking the learning road together. That, that, that's not what's going on here. That, that shouldn't be what's going on. Uh, now, the, the sort of banking model, I don't know if he's talking. He's talking about that sort of transactional thing, then that's that's silly, right? That it's a silly description. It's kind of I guess I, you can say it's accurate, I suppose, if you want to think of it as you know, the students are paying for a service. 
and the teacher is giving them not information for a service, but again, help learning uh, as a service. Okay, sure, but why banking? It's probably I, it's, he just didn't like banking. I don't know. Um, but it's certainly if the criti- if the criticism is that we as educators are not merely depositing information into our students' minds. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. That that's a bad way of teaching. But, but the fact is that no one teaches like that outside of the well, funny enough, outside the Prussian model, um, which is largely what's used in American public education. The Prussian model uh, is designed to one teach conformity rather than rather than uh, knowledge or wisdom, uh, and two to uh, to focus on the regurgitation of facts. Again, this is neither of these things are particularly conducive to, to education, but both of these things are are um, the common mode of American public education. Relying on a banking model is bad pedagogy, as teaching to the test fails to produce deep understanding. But seriously though, there are some tests that I studied for in high school and college that operated this way, and if my life depended on it, I could not tell you what trigonometry is. Gone to my head, couldn't tell you what it is. A scholar Brian Wish describes it, according to Ferry, the banking model is not just oppressive, it's also ineffective. It decontextualizes knowledge, leading students to merely memorize the material by rote, rather than understanding it conceptually. This discourages critical thinking and conditions people to accept authority without question. Yeah, it sounds like he's just describing the Prussian model. Okay, if he wants to, okay, this is a, this is a terminology I've not heard. Um, I've not read Freire, so I, okay, fair enough. Um, yeah, if this is this sounds to me just like the Prussian model of education, which is again the 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 mode which is most commonly used in American public education, uh, and that that is, yeah, that's bad, because again, as stated here, it doesn't work. Um, and it is more, uh, it is more, um, more oriented towards the uh, the development of uh, deference, deference to authority rather than critical examination or critical thinking. Which again, critical theory rejects critical thinking per se. And and if you'll notice, they rely very heavily upon uh, deference to authority as well. Critical theory is absolutely about deference to authority. It's just an inversion of the classical authority structure. That's all. Under this model, students learn to passively accept what they're taught. As when there isn't space for discussion and dialogue, there isn't space for questions and critique. Huh. Almost like we've gone through a major crisis of that recently, of the vast majority of the world's population unquestioning, unquestioningly accepting what they've thought, and a few outlier critical thinkers getting in trouble for saying the obvious things that anyone should be able to notice. Curious. I'm talking about COVID. And that's why it's so concerning that some states flirt with ideas like not teaching political theories like socialism or communism or dedicate time to teaching about why any ideological alternatives to capitalism are bad. To be clear, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that we should teach people that, that capitalism is bad and you should all be Trotskyists. I'm simply saying both. We got, we got to learn them all and we got Gotta learn them all, huh? Okay. Should we, here's how you test this theory. Should we learn national socialism? Should we learn fascism? Should we learn Maoism? Getting a little closer to what you probably think so. Should we learn uh, distributism? Uh, should we learn classical medieval throne and altar? Um, oh gosh. Two swords, Galician two swords doctrine. I don't think so. I don't think you want that. I think that you think we should learn what we what we realistically have, which is which is uh, democratic republicanism, broadly speaking, uh, and we should learn what you want, which is various species of communism or socialism. Now, even setting that aside, I don't think that we should just sort of neutrally teach all of the different possible political theories. I think that we should learn about various political theories, but it's important to learn them, learn about them within a particular context. That, for example, every time communism has been tried, is wound, it has resulted in millions of corpses. That fascism is, is a uh, an inefficient and a violent means of uh, of uh, developing an economy which will ultimately collapse and uh, ultimately collapse when the political power structure dissolves when the leader dies. Things like that, right? Fine. Yes, teach the flaws of the systems. Yeah, absolutely, because guess what? We might actually have an idea, or a few ideas, about what systems work and what system, well, 
relatively speaking at least, and what systems have what problems. So yeah, I do think that we should teach about communism in school, but primarily, funny enough, I'm agreeing with DeSantis here, we should be teaching about what's wrong with it. Because again, communism is, is thoroughly bankrupt as a political theory. Um, there, there's, there's no realistic way of defending, uh, there's no, there's no, there's no intellectually honest way of defending communism as political, uh, especially after uh, both historical evidence and then also theoretical critique. So no, I don't think that we should be teaching obviously false ideas as a, as a hypothetical possibility. No, no. If, if, if something is obviously false, we should, we should still learn about it. We, our kids should still learn about it. But we should learn what's false about it, not not the not the idea that it might be true. We got things for ourselves. Is that bad? Is that bad? Tell me if it's bad. And this is why Frary challenges the notion that, that not we gotta learn them all, and we got things for ourselves. Is that bad? Is that bad? Tell me if it's bad. And this is why Wait, what bad. Oh, it's not bad, comrade. Oh, okay. Okay, well, there we go. Mask off. That took me entirely too long to figure out, but there we go. No, no, I do think that um that again, this is just a very clear uh admission. Might as well be really an admission that that this whole uh, we should just teach we should just sort of neutrally teach uh, all the various different perspectives, wink, uh, and let students come up with whatever conclusion they want, wink, um, is just it's to give us a particular uh, a particular outcome, right? Now this also leads to uh, there, there's another potential threat with this. Um, gosh, it's, uh, it has a few names that it can go by. It's, um, I think probably the most common, the common way of saying is the fallacy of gray, uh, which is the idea that if you have two opposing perspectives, uh, in the metaphor, white and black, that the truth is probably going to be somewhere in the middle, but that's not the case necessarily. It's often not right. Um, if I ask, uh, if I ask, uh, what color is uh, is full spectrum sunlight, white or black? You you shouldn't say gray. It's white, right? There's an answer to the question. Uh, is communism good or bad? Well, there's nuance to it. No, there's not. It's just bad. It's bad in basically every way possible. Um, and, and and this is really easy to fall into, especially if you do this whole like presenting all the various options, because we have this desire to uh, to uh, a sort of cognitive bias to to skew towards the center of various given options, uh, and so you can also, by the way, you can also do this if you're willing to be manipulative. Um, you can you can manipulate a prospective student's outcomes, the uh, the, the intellectual outcomes, by setting the Overton window wherever you want it. And expecting them to skew for the center of it, right? So if you if you place the far right option as national socialism and the far left option as communism, guess what you're gonna have? You're gonna have people who are what? Moderate socialists, democratic socialists, maybe. What happens, right? Uh, again, fallacy of the gray that uh, if there is a a, a well. If you're given a yes or no question, some people say yes, some people say no. The answer is not necessarily kinda. Um, I, I can say this from uh, from my own experience, right? When I was when I was a silly high school student, and I was being taught in roughly the way he is describing that there are uh, that there's this one ideology called capitalism, which is about free markets and uh, and, uh, and and free trade and all that kind of stuff, and then there's this other this other economic model called communism or called socialism, which is about government control and such and all that sort of thing. Naturally. What happens to students who are at this point not very good at thinking, but they're but I was pretty smart to be fair, um, but still not terribly experienced, not terribly uh, careful in my thinking. What I did was, of course, I skewed to the center. And what you will get out of teaching that capitalism is an option and socialism is an option is you'll get a bunch of students who are advocating for what I thought was a good idea in eleventh grade ish, whenever that was, which was a mixed economy. Like, you know what? You're, you you have the thesis, you have the antithesis, so what, what do we have? We have to do the synthesis, right? No. Absolutely not. When presented between, uh, between you know, options of good and evil, picking a little evil, gray, is not a good idea. It's not, it's, it's... There are times at which, there are times where 
Some people think something and other people think something else. And the truth really does lie in the middle. But it's probably less often than not. Probably more often, what, what's really the case is that some people are right and others are wrong. Some people think the Earth is round. Some people think that the Earth is flat. Should we think that the world is an oval? No. That's ridiculous. Um, it's, it, it's very clearly the case that, that one camp is right, one camp is wrong. And it's, it really can be that simple, but we don't want it to be. It's, again, it's a sort of cognitive bias. And by teaching in this way, by teaching in the way of, well, here are some neutral options that we should consider, you will almost certainly have the majority of students saying, well, we should find some kind of a compromise. We should find something in the middle. Uh, everybody wants to be a radical centrist. Everybody wants to be a moderate, even though that, that is often not, uh, not correct, uh, or in some cases not even viable. Okay, anyway, that's, uh, that is uh, a lot to criticize about this, and all coming from his sneakily little snuck-in mask-off moment. And this is why Freire challenges the notion that knowledge is a gift bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those whom they consider to know nothing. He writes, knowledge emerges only through invention and reinvention, through the restless and patient, continuing, hopeful inquiry human beings pursue in the world, with the world, and with each other. He's described... Okay, yeah, that, I, I think that's largely right. Um, because I think that the, way, the best way to teach is something like a Socratic method, where you are not just imparting information, but you are... You are showing your students how to come across or come up with the information uh, themselves, but you are guiding them along the way. Again, the guidance part of it is, is absolutely essential. And that's part, that's the part where, uh, that's the part where Risecracker is kind of dismissing it. I don't think he thinks that the guidance part of that is all necessary, but again, without Socrates there, uh, the, the, the kid from the Mino would not have figured out the Pythagorean theorem. He would not have figured it out if Socrates hadn't been guiding him through it. Describing learning as an active and engaged process of discovery, questioning and re-questioning. A process which doesn't create tiny humans who are packed with information, like USB storage drives that love cartoons and sometimes wet the bed, but rather creates curious little thinkers who also sometimes wet the bed. Also, if you made it this far in the video and you're thinking, is Burns a little more jacked up than usual? I've been drinking this can of coffee I got and it turns out that I shouldn't drink cold brew because I feel right now like I'm on the types of drugs that I've never taken. But it has to Ice coffee is... Uh... is either an entirely different beverage coming around to that or an explicit violation of the natural law. Anyway, it to be something like this. This model of education has a political edge for Freire. Now that sounds scary. Remember that even Aristotle thought education and politics were inherently linked. To Freire, education is a liberatory process, which means that it must create the space for questioning authority. For him, authentic liberation, the process of humanization, is not another deposit to be made in man. And no oppressive order could permit the oppressed to begin to question why. And this is what courses on things like race and gender or even history taught accurately do. They create the space to think through various modes of oppression in our society. And do they though? Do they really? Um, now, I, I attempt to do that sort of thing. I attempt to, to teach in a way that will, will uh, provide for the questioning of authority. But I think that this is, a, this is a nasty trend that leftists tend to have. They tend to think that, that they tend to think that the right is in power. Which is kind of absurd, uh, culturally speaking, especially. Uh, like again, if you look at if you look at institutions, if you look at uh, at sort of long running political institutions, even uh, what you find is a uh, a broadly left, more or less center left, uh, at least politically slant, and culturally you find uh, that the mainstream view, the authority against which he would allegedly have us question. That sentence didn't work. The authority that he would allegedly have us question, let's say. Um, that that is, uh, that that is the vast right wing, the, the conservative Christians type. But if you actually look at the world, it's not. It's the woke. It is the woke mind virus that he says. Uh, it is the, uh, the the position that would have been too radical for political leftists 10 years ago. That's what is, uh, what is the sort of unquestioned dogma of our society. And perhaps even unquestionable. 
And that's kind of the problem here is that DeSantis et al. are attempting to bring in questions to that authoritative structure. And to quickly say something positive about Florida education, when I was in middle school, I participated in a statewide African-American history curriculum and contest. And the experience was really, really transformative for me. Um, it challenged me. It made me think differently about myself, my place in society, and the place of people like me in society. And it was really important. So thanks for that, Florida. Now, So again, the concern about programs like that is that they are not typically, and you can tell this from the way he described it, they're not typically meant to... Uh, to showcase the contributions of African Americans to society, I got that kind of stuff in my in my education, and I think that, that that's that's beneficial. That's great. Um, I I don't know if it's I don't know if it should be a kind of specific dedication kind of thing. Um, I don't know how to say this that I don't know if it should be necessarily a focus. Right? I don't I don't I don't think that it's particularly productive to focus on the the you know people of this race. This is the time to learn about the people of this race. It's more I think we should probably be a little more holistic in our way of teaching say history and look at the history of say this period and look at the contributions of various people including African Americans etc. That's probably the better way of teaching it. But you'll notice again that by the way he describes this it's it's given he says things like American history curriculum and contest. And the experience was really, really transformative for me. Um, it challenged me. It made me think differently about myself, my place in society. Okay, so it, it challenged me. It made me think differently about myself, my place in society. And the place of people like me in society. And the place of people like me in society. So basically, again, this is taught from the perspective of, uh, of, crit of criticizing whiteness. Which is again a critical it's critical race theory uh, that is that is an early development of critical race theory, but it was critical race theory this is this is sort of in the um the very early developments that say Ibram X Kendi, uh even going back a little further than that um but th this is this is absolutely counterproductive. I think that, that is absolutely detrimental to race relations, and it's why I think that we have we've seen a a rapid decline in amicable race relations in the last gosh, I don't know. 20 years, maybe, maybe more. Um, I think it is, it is hard to say. It, it's almost certain, I think, that amicable relationships between the races in the United States were far, uh, we, we, were on, we were in a much better position in the, say, late 90s, early 2000s. Once the, once, think about, like, okay, what was the biggest what were the biggest racial scandals of the 1990s? This was this was when I was a very small kid, so I might be missing some things. But O.J. Simpson trial, which was a big deal. Don't get me wrong, big deal. It was late. That was 90 something. Right? That was a big deal. Uh, and there were racial elements to it, and that led to some tension. Fine. And what the L.A. race riots? I guess is that even the 90s? But those were like the big racial issues. But now, in the last ten years or so, we've had a we've had um, disruptions to race relations on that scale, probably every year for probably the last ten years, give or take. I think that that is a uh, that is I think largely a result of this mode of thinking and this mode of education. Whereas, you know, I I think that we had a chance of what we would probably realistic be reasonable in calling a, a a sort of colorblind generation because i didn't think of race at all when i was growing up yeah i had mostly white friends because I, I i that was the majority in the area i lived but i also had friends of other races and i didn't think of them in racial terms like there are friends who there are friends i had and to some degree even so still, still have to, to to some degree who i like didn't even recognize that they were of a different race until years later because again it wasn't relevant there was a time then in the 90s and early 2000s that i think i think we kind of had racism beat to a large degree now fine there was still work to be done especially in, in various places fine but largely uh, we were on the right track and then i don't know we uh we went down this kind of a route and it 
led to some uh, to a lot of backsliding, so to speak. Uh, and I think it came uh, it came out of out of a kind of um, fomenting of interracial resentment in 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 all directions, in all directions, which uh, which is certainly unhealthy. And it was really important. So thanks for that, Florida. Now, anthropologist and professor David Graeber once said that he prefers self-subverting authority. I think there are certain types of authority which undermine their own basis. If you're a teacher and you teach someone very well, they know what you used to know, so there's no further basis for your authority. In other words, great... Okay, so... This is just a... This seems like just a kind of um, edgy way of saying um, making yourself obsolete. Which is a good thing, which is a good thing, absolutely. Um, but that's not actually the case, right? I, I don't make myself obsolete by teaching my students what I know. Even if I were to teach all of my students everything that I know, if I were to get them to the stage that I'm at, if all of my students were to major in philosophy, first of all, that's a bad idea. I'll tell them as much. Um, some of them, great. Most of them, maybe shouldn't. Um, but if they all learn everything I have to teach, I'm, no long, I'm still not obsolete, because now I have another generation of students to teach Right, I have a particular service to them. That's my service to them. And now this is also why I have no problem with, uh, you know, connecting with former students on social media, um, because they have received a good deal of of wisdom from me, hopefully at least. And so we are on something closer to even footing. But but that doesn't mean that my authority is undermined. It means that it's fully re it's, it's reinforced by their ability to properly recognize it. Just because they have equivalent authority doesn't mean I don't have it, right? Equ authority is not a zero-sum game. It's, 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 a, uh, it's, it's something that we each, all of us, can build to. On it's, basis. If you're a teacher and you teach someone very well, they know what you used to know, so there's no further basis for your authority. There's still a basis for you. No, that's ridiculous. There's like I said, there's still a basis for your authority, especially if they know what you, not what you used to know, what you do know. They know that they know what you know. They know that you know it, and they presumably agree with it. Or they might disagree, and they might challenge you on it. And there is again some real possibility of of, of scholarly camaraderie happening there. But that doesn't undermine the basis of your authority. It reinforces it. I, that's. Oh, no, no, that's not right at all. This, this is the fundamental misunderstanding of authority and confusing it with power. Again, I have an essay about this, uh, in an article, I guess, about this. I'll, I'll put a link about, again, the distinction between power and authority um, in the description, because, again, I think this is mixing it up. This is saying that you, that this is assuming that you only have authority over someone if you have power over them, which is not the case. Not the case at all. Um, authority is, again, something that, that simply means that you are you are more likely to be, or you are not more likely, it's not comparative, you are likely to be consistently correct about something. And so you are considered an authority on the subject. And if your student, if you've taught them to be just as, li just as authoritative, just as likely to be consistently correct, they know that yeah, they can still rely on you to be consistently correct and to reliably agree with them. So no, this does not undermine your authority. It might undermine your power because that's all that sort of Foucaultians, neo or post-structuralists ever think of, think about. That's their only lens through which they they view society. But authority is 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 independent of that, and it does actually it is maintained through this process. In other words, great educators should be creating the conditions for their own obsolescence. They should teach students okay, what they know, encourage them to think critically, and push them to go even further. Remember, guys, even the greatest teacher of his day taught people that the sun revolved around the earth. And he just proved that theory, making Aristotle and everybody else on earth look like a bitch. Um, yes, so he did, but there are also good reasons to think that, like, if you look up in the sky. Um, yeah, it's actually, uh, it's actually really hard to prove that uh, the Earth revolves around the sun, uh, particularly without very sophisticated telescopy. Um, in fact, Galileo's, uh, Galileo had really shitty evidence for it. Really being precise. Anyway, sorry, uh, I digress.
This is why Ferry doesn't think education should be a process in which information is deposited, tests are taken, diplomas are obtained, and jobs are acquired. Rather, education should prepare us for life and make us fully human. Asking questions about societal structures, social conditions, and political realities furthers that end, as does asking big questions about art, religion, and science. And this is why Ferry thought education was a two-way street, as educators need to be challenged by the material experiences of their students, learning from their insights and being pushed to think more deeply. For Aristotle, Ferry, and lots of folks in between, education isn't about getting us a job, and our jobs aren't fundamental in shaping our identities. The purpose of learning and teaching is to create a dialogue between student and teacher that fosters curiosity, empathy, critical thinking, and creativity. Now, before I don't know about empathy there, that's a little odd. Hold on, let me see that. Let me hear the list again. A dialogue between student and teacher that fosters curiosity, empathy, critical thinking, and creativity. Okay. Curiosity, empathy, critical thinking, creativity. Yeah. Okay. Empathy, I'm a little bit. I'm suspicious. People often use the term empathy to smuggle in bad ideas uh, with something that sounds nice. Because it seems to me as if this is uh, a way of sort of bringing in the idea of lived experience as, as in some way authoritative in terms of uh, in terms of evidence or critical thinking or something like that. Which I mean, lived experience is 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 that's anecdotal, right? It's not. It shouldn't really be the basis of uh, of any grand theories that we might have. Um, and so, so when he's talking about empathy here, the reason I suspect this is because it seems to be that the idea is that we, we, meaning teacher and student, exchange our own experiences and learn from our, from our experiences that we share and that we have, uh, independent of each other. Uh, we learn from each other in that respect, which is not really all that beneficial from, from a scholarly perspective, right? Learning, learning from the experiences of other people is of limited use aside from, say, controlled experimentation or observational studies or things like that. So, again, I think that I think that this is almost right. He's got something here, but danger of going off the rails. Now, I will say the idea that, that education is an end in itself and that it is uh, it is about making us better, more more properly structured and virtuous people. Spot on. Absolutely. On board with that. The idea that education is not and should not be for job training, should not be for career advancement, that sort of thing, and that it's probably a bad idea if that's what you're pursuing it for. Absolutely right. Um, that most, uh, especially liberal arts education, is not going to get you a better job. Or it might a little bit, but not. it's not guaranteed. It's nowhere near a guarantee, and it's probably not worth the investment. Um, but that everyone probably should do it at some point. Yeah, still agree. Still agree. Again, I, I, agree, with like, I agree with them like 80% of the way. Then he just kind of brings his own woefully wrong ideology into it. Now, before we wrap up, um, I read some comments on a recent video where some of you said you feel like we're breaking down some intense and kind of dark topics and not leaving you with anything constructive or positive. While we don't have a magical fix for this one, I can really recommend that you read Ferry's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. It's a really, really great work written by someone who was actively engaged in the process of teaching those on the margins of society. And even I actually, I think I've read a review or something of this because I'm vaguely familiar with the with the title. I, I know I've, I'm. I, I know I know the title, and I'm vaguely familiar with, uh, with it. So a lot of this is sounding somewhat familiar, but again, I think that that a lot of a lot of what he's putting forward here is is specifically about the undermining of classical modes of education. It's it's there is a school of of thought within educational studies called critical pedagogy, which which does seek explicitly to do a lot of these things, undermining traditional uh, traditional authoritative structures, um, uh, and then of course leading students into thinking in particular ways. That being uh, in terms of critical theory, in terms of uh, in terms of equity, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the the inversion of classical uh, classical authorities, things like that. And so again, I think that this is. Uh, this is the bad. This is the this is the bad ending uh, to this. I think that this is the wrong approach uh, to to fixing this issue. Uh, go back further. Go back to Aristotle. Uh, go back to Plato. Really. Um, go back to the medievals. Look at the medieval university system if you really want to look at a uh, a robust uh, a robust um, system of scholarly debate. That's what you really should be looking. At. All right. Let's hear him out, and uh, then we'll. And um, it should be, be about done. We're almost to outros.
even though it's an intense book, um, it has a really hopeful tone to it. And as much as possible, we encourage everyone to support all of those people who work in education. As in this country, no one is doing something so important while getting paid so little. So to the college professors having their curriculums curtailed, to people at the you know elementary, middle, high school, preschool level that are dealing with book bans and angry parents and all this sort of stuff, we're with you for what it's worth. Um, and if there is a teacher in- Okay, so anyway, I am a teacher in your life, by the way. And if you do want to support me, feel free. <laughs> Go right down, uh, right down to kofi.com slash Professor McCoy. Feel free to support me monetarily. Um, he does have a point that I am an adjunct, as an adjunct professor of philosophy, I don't make a lot of money. Um, and so, and if you want to help, I will appreciate it. But, but beyond that, um, the whole, uh, the whole benighted educators line gets, gets tired relatively quickly because again, I, again, it is a service that I provide and that, that service is by my own argument, something akin to leisure, uh, and personal development rather than a solid investment. And again, I think that that, that is something that we should uh, absolutely, uh, be willing to, to, to put money and effort into by all means. Um, but that the model that we currently have is, is bizarre and, uh, and largely unsustainable. And I think a lot of people are recognizing that and it's gonna, it's gonna disrupt some things, uh, in some bad ways and maybe eventually in some good ways, but that might be the too long-term thinking, but, but we'll see. Um, all in all, I think that again, uh, as is often the case with these wisecrack videos, I'm on board with, a with, usually a little over half of it. And then it kind of goes off the rails at some point. Uh, in this case, it went off the rails into uh, into what we would probably fairly describe as woke leftism, uh, as, as uh, equity, again, being the uh, being the, the, the primary culprit of the, the sort of DEI trilemma. And, I, and again, I think that um, this kind of this kind of rejection of, of classical education in an attempt at defending it is is the the kind of internal contradiction that you find in uh, in critical theory, and I think that that is uh, that is it's it's trying to solve a very real problem with a solution that is bound to only make it worse. So again, I think that uh, that that the uh, the real way of maybe fixing the uh, the educational conundrum is to start thinking about it in the right way. Start thinking about education as an end good rather than as an investment, uh, and to start thinking of it as a real good. Uh, as a real end good, something that is uh, worthwhile in itself, uh, and know what it's worthwhile for, that it's worthwhile for the development of person, development of virtue, and the development of uh, of ourselves into who we ought to want to be. And that, of course, does require something like a classical uh, classical education model, uh, a, uh, a an understanding of education uh, that has this, as, this, you know, wisdom as a goal in mind and not merely uh, technical know-how. Anyway, this wasn't bad. Um, I, 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 I liked this one. He had some really good things to say. He also had some not so great things to say. Um, but I think that we, uh, we hopefully got a pretty good discussion out of it. So thank you for recommending this one to me. Uh, again, if you have other recommendations for things you'd like to re like me to react to, by all means, let me know whether that is in, in the comments, whether that's on Facebook, whether that's on Discord or wherever else you might find me. Uh, do feel free to let me know. I'm always happy to do these reaction videos. I have a lot of fun with them. Uh, and uh, I think we get a good discussion going. Anyway, that's all I've got for this one. I'll see you all next time. Uh, remember, don't be safe. Be well. More importantly, be good. Bye, everyone.